Okay, I, what I thought I'd do is break down a little bit more the relationship between equivalent variation, contingent uh, variation, uh, and the idea of willingness to pay except. Now, again, this is in the context of environmental amenities, so we can have some sense of the value that that humans placed on uh, environmental goods and services so that then we can better inform policy and, and uh, really the focus tends to be on cost effective policy. So we want to have a good measure for what society and individuals are willing to pay uh, for environmental protection or willing to accept uh, for environmental degradation. And in the context here, economists sort of fall back upon microeconomic theory, mostly the concept of utility maximization and extensions of that concept to put forward theoretical estimations of this willingness to pay and willingness to accept. So uh, let's clarify that point a little bit more. So the classic notion of utility maximization uh, in the microeconomic framework is that you have individuals who uh, face budget constraints, which here is represented by the linear line, uh, where the axes are formed simply by taking your income M and dividing it by the price of that particular good. And, you know, in a relatively obvious sense, the intercepts represent the maximum amount of each good that you could consume if you consumed nothing but that particular good. Uh, and then, of course, the budget constraint represents the opportunity cost of changing the mix of the goods that you consume, what we refer to as the bundle. And so when you look at the budget constraint, you want to think about there being bundles of the two goods all along the budget constraint. And what consumers are trying to do is they're trying to find the mix, uh, the bundle of the two goods that maximizes their utility. And the way that we visualize the maximization of utility is we rely upon uh, indifference curves. And when you, you see indifference curves, what they represent is a level of utility. And we're not gonna really go into the uh, sausage making that is utility maximization in this particular video, um, but suffice it to say that the goal for consumers is to try to consume on the highest possible indifference curve that they can. And usually the way that we frame this is uh, the indifference curve that forms a tangency condition uh, with the uh, budget constraint. And so, so if the prices change or if your income changes, uh, it is most likely that you are going to then therefore either be able to consume on a higher indifference curve um, if the price changes or decreases or the income change is an increase, or you may have to consume on a lower indifference curve if the price changes are, are in fact uh, greater and the income is a loss. So the reason why we use this idea to discuss the notion of environmental protection and, and also environmental degradation is that we can essentially show in a microeconomic sense, what happens when there is a disruption of an environmental amenity. Uh, and in particular, the way that we think about this is that the price of the environmental amenity uh, rises. Um, and so uh, if there is environmental disruption, the uh, cost associated with enjoying the environment uh, goes up. And so we can visualize the idea of environmental disruption through the utility maximization framework um, by simply altering the budget constraint. So for example, let's assume that uh, Y is an environmental good uh, and let's assume that the price of Y rises. Um, we see that the price of Y rises gives us a new budget constraint, um, which is just the original budget, budget constraint uh, pivoted downward a little bit. We also notice that we go from indifference curve zero to indifference curve one. Indifference curve one is below that of indifference curve zero, uh, implying that that's a lower level of utility. So not too surprising is that one of the effects of the increase in the price of the environmental good is that the consumer is worse off. Um, and so this is a nice application of the idea that when there is environmental degradation, this is damaging to uh, people in society, right? It's, it's costing them 
uh, money in, in ways. Um, and we want to sort of visualize that. And then ultimately, we want to think about how making those individuals whole again, you know, rectify find the damage uh, and or what is taken from those individuals when the damage happens. And then that's the way that we can sort of think about the notion of willingness to pay and willingness to accept towards uh, policy uh, and environmental disruption uh, in general. So the first, you know, sort of way that we tend to think about this is the question, how much would we have to compensate you to make you just as happy as you were before the price change? you know, using the new prices. So basically the argument here is that, okay, there has been a price change. The price of good Y has increased. How much would we have to pay you? That is how much of your income would we have to increase such that you are just as happy as you were before the price change, given the price change. And so the easiest way to think about CV is that we wanna use the old utility, but with new prices. So if you look at the graph here, um, what you'll see is that when we say use the new prices, um, this is the new budget constraint that was formed when the price of good Y increased, right? So this is the original budget constraint where the price of good Y was its old uh, amount. And then this was the budget constraint when the price of uh, good Y increased. Now, what we want to do is we want to draw a line which is parallel to this new budget constraint and that means we're using the new prices right because the budget constraint and the slope of the budget constraint um, changes when the prices change and so we want to retain the new slope um, that retains the new prices and then we just want to see where the new slope sloped line uh, would be on the original indifference curve. So essentially, we want to measure uh, how much do we need to shift uh, from this uh, new budget constraint with the new higher price for good Y, such that given that new higher price for good Y, uh, this person is back to the original budget constraint. And so you can see here in the blue dotted line uh, that this is uh, roughly about where we would have to shift this individual in order for them to be able to be just as happy as they were before the price change, uh, given the new price of good Y. Um, this vertical distance of the shift, um, that's the amount of money that you would have to pay someone to make them just as well off as they were before the price change, after the price change. And so that's why we refer to this as compensating variation. Um, this can get a little confusing, and even sometimes when you teach it, you can get things a little backwards. But with CV, it's important to remember two things. First off, we're looking at old utility, right? So in this case, that was higher utility with the new prices. In this case, this was a higher price. So in this case, something bad has happened. There's been a damage in, in, in the form of an increase in the price of good Y. So essentially what we're asking is, how much would I have to pay you to compensate you for that damage, right? And so we know that the way that we can affect people's budgets is by giving them more money, uh, by increasing their income. And when we increase the income, uh, the budget constraint uh, shifts uh, by the amount uh, of the increase. And so whatever we would have to pay someone to make them able to consume on this new indifference curve, that is the compensating variation. How much would we have to compensate you to make you just as happy as you were before the price change using the new prices? Okay, and then the second type of willingness to pay estimation uh, comes from the notion of equivalent variation. Uh, here is how much would we take from you, I'm sorry, excuse me, how much would we have to take from you to make you just as worse off as you are after the price change using the old prices. So the basic idea here is we know what happens to you when the price of good Y goes up. We know that there in a sense is economic damage. You are worse off than you were before the price change. So the question for equivalent variation is, well, how much would we just have to have taken from you originally to make you now as worse off as you were 
after the price actually changed. So here we're going to look at the new utilities, the new lower utility, but we're going to consider the old prices. Okay. And it's just like before, this involves a shift of the budget constraint, but we're shifting the original budget constraint. So in CV, you know, noticed that the parallel shift occurred from the new budget constraint, which you can see has a little bit less slope uh, than the original budget constraint. With EV, we're shifting a parallel shift from the original budget constraint. So you remember we're using the old prices, so the slope of the budget constraint is going to be the same uh, for EV as it was originally. And so it's just a parallel shift of this original budget constraint, and then it's getting to the new lower level of utility. So this vertical distance, the shift, is the amount of money that you would have to take from someone to make them just as worse off as they were going to be if the price change occurred. And so the idea is, is that this vertical shift is that amount of money. And so again, for CV, it's how much would we have to pay you after the price change to make you just as happy as you were before the price change. And for EV, it's how much would we have to take from you before the price change to make you just as worse off as you were after the price change. Now, why do we care about this? In environmental valuation, we are trying to measure willingness to pay for environmental protection and or the willingness to accept for environmental degradation. We do this because when we spend money on regulatory policies or spend money on just general environmental policy, we need to know how much to spend. In essence, we need to know how valuable is the environment to people. Now, that's a very difficult number to estimate. Um, there's both economic values as well as non-economic values, what we refer to as use and non-use values. So it's actually very difficult to elicit a willingness to pay for environmental amenities from individuals. So the way that economists go about trying to get at this is we rely upon the microeconomic theory of EV and CV, which essentially allows us, for example, in a contingent valuation survey, to ask people questions that essentially gets at these types of questions. The question of, how much would we have to pay you to get you to accept a certain amount of environmental degradation and or how much would you accept in order to avoid the environmental degradation? Um, and so the idea here is we're gauging essentially what people are willing to pay to prevent environmental degradation or what they would be willing to accept to endure it. Okay. And in strict theory, EV and CV should be equivalent, meaning that what you would lose if something bad happened, that's EV, is equivalent to what you'd accept to endure it, right? So in other words, EV represents the damage caused by environmental degradation. CV represents what you'd have to pay us to make us just as good as we were before the environmental damage. But in practice, there's all sorts of reasons why actual EV and CV, that is real EV and CV amongst individuals, are not necessarily equivalent. One example is loss aversion, because people tend to think about losses as being worse than the equivalent uh, compensation that would make you whole. So in other words, if I said to you, uh, I'm going to uh, take $10 from you, um, and then what would you accept as compensation, um, research actually shows that humans will want a premium. Um, so it's not just that you took $10 from me, but it's almost like you took more than $10 from me because I don't like losing things, right? So it's like the $10 loss. And then there's this additional premium on top of that because we experienced a loss. You know, it's kind of like punitive damages in lawsuits, right? So there's like the economic damages that we want and seek compensation for. And then there's like the punitive damages, which is like the stress associated with having to deal with the problem. And this is one of the difficulties with environmental valuation is there's sort of both economic and punitive uh, damages associated with the environment. 
right? There's like the economic loss, and then there's sort of the more uh, human, you know, kind of environmental loss. And to economists, this is obviously a very difficult thing to deal with. One of the ways that we could potentially deal with this is relying upon EV and CV ideas to ask people questions uh, in a contingent uh, situation, how much they would accept or how much they would pay uh, for a given environmental uh, disruption or prevention uh, of that particular disruption. 